All right, we are live. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Did I get that from you? Were you, you did. did you, uh, coin that phrase. All right, so For today years. we've got the legend, uh, Mike Zuber, one rental at a time. I think that a good uh, conversation to have with you, um, since you're helping people one rental at a time. Um, for some of them, they're escaping a day job. For for a lot of people, I think they're doing it the slow and steady way. You know, case in point, me as I'm <laughs> working a job that you know I enjoy most of the time. Um, <laughs> slowly but surely, accumulating real estate assets to where someday there's going to be a point where I go, well, maybe I can just kind of transition and do less of this and more of this, or at least it gives you the optionality or or, or choice freedom, right? Right. Um, so I think for those that don't know you, maybe we start off there with an introduction. Who the heck is Mike Zuber? What is one rental at a time? And how might you impart some of your years of wisdom on, uh, you know, us? Sure. So, uh, you know, I am a full-time employee first and foremost, I'm not an entrepreneur, not, not like yourself, right? You run a business. I was an employee, uh, I'm Generation X. I'm over 50, which means I was raised, you know, my mother's mantra was go to school, get a good job so you can make a lot of money and, and climb the corporate ladder, right? My my future was to retire at 65 or, or 70. That's, that's what was supposed to happen. Um, I was also coming of age during the dot-com crisis or dot-com era. I successfully turned 7,000 bucks into almost 200 grand only to lose 80% of it in the crash. And frankly, at the end of that, felt like a complete failure. I was now, you know, 30 years old or thereabouts and had a kid, you know, raising a kid, had a family and was feeling like a failure. And I stumbled across the old purple book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it opened up a whole new world to me. Rich Dad, Poor Dad to me told me that, hey, if you just got four rental properties as a full time employee, that I would have options. And my you know, I was thinking options at 65, right? I'd have, I was 31, 32 when I started. I thought, hey, have the tenants paid off by the time I'm 62? You know, I'll have, I'll have a better retirement than anybody I knew. That was my grand vision. Lo and behold, you get in the game, you start doing the work. You know, we got to eight houses. Uh, we realized that housing was expensive in 06 and unaffordable. So unlike a lot of talkers, we sold. We sold all our eight houses and did 1031 exchanges. So we sold at the peak or damn near the peak and, and jumped to 80 units. And then the crash came. And I was writing on bigger pockets at the time, talking about the deals we were doing. Uh, I had a wealth I had a website called Wealth Building Pro, which was just my online blog about what we were doing. And uh, that led to raising millions of dollars to buy more junk. Right? I, I raised millions of dollars in private money at the bottom of the market. And, you know, lo and behold, the market came back and, you know, we, in, we end the story. I was 45 and I retired at a moment's notice. I'd always planned to work till 50, but, you know, some events happened where it was no longer, you know, reasonable to stay where I was. So I decided to just jump ship. And I can tell you, jumping out when you're financially secure, but having nothing to jump to is a mistake. I would tell people that are building like yourself slowly to, to build towards something, right? Do you want to be a coach? Do you want to do something? Because if you just jump out, even if the money's okay, you get depressed. And I was, I was as financially comfortable as I've ever been, but getting increasingly depressed by the day. So I almost got a job. I mean, what a complete failure that would have been to get huh. a job just because you're, you're not feeling compelled. And from that, sitting at the kitchen table, I came up with the idea of one rental at a time, one rental at a time at the very beginning. And I'd love to hear from the audience. I wrote that book as, oh, it's basically, okay, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, now what? And the now what was 15 years, the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, so that book became a YouTube channel, which became courses, which became live events. And it's been fun to see the community grow after five years. I now have a millionaire series, which you're a part of where, you know, I talk to 15 to 20 millionaires each and every week and, and we try to help people. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Awesome, man. Yeah. I can tell you firsthand experience because I talk to many people who are one rental at a time, you know, course members, followers, you know, uh, they, they listen to the daily financial news and they're inspired. 
they're 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 driven and you know they're eternally grateful for all the stuff that, that you're putting out most of it free right um mm -hmm. and so you know thank you for that a couple of things you said stood out so quick question you mentioned rich dad poor dad and the idea of four properties did it come from rich dad poor dad or was no the what came from rich dad poor dad i got it this is shocking this is so this is our school system broken and oh, by the way, it's not recently broken, right? I got out of, I got out of college or high school in 1990. So long time broken. I'm 30 years old. I have an, a degree in economics. I have a master's in business administration. I was an accountant and a financial analyst, and I knew nothing about rental properties. I mean, think about how the lunacy of that. I've got six years of advanced education all around, you know, finances and financial statements and the economy. And Nobody had ever talked about rental properties. Rich Dad, Poor Dad gave me a new mindset and painted and opened up a new asset. Rich Dad, Poor Dad's not a how-to book. There's not a how-to in that book. But I remember him and Kim talking about two different condos. He bought one in Hawaii. She bought one in, I think, Oregon. And I'm like, huh, they can do that. We can do that. That was it. And I, I, the reason I got four was just I thought, I thought that'd be a million bucks. Right. I thought each house would be worth 250 grand in 30 years. And that would be a million dollars. That was the extent of my sophisticated analysis. Right. Which, which there's, there's, there's something to just getting started. Like you even talked about it. It wasn't the big vision you have today, but if you never start, you never know where it's going to lead, which has led you to all the cool stuff you're doing, the rental portfolio you and Olivia have all the, you know, financial freedom and life freedom that you and Olivia have, like mm -hmm. doesn't happen if step number one isn't taken. Um, and so um, one thing I, I just wrote a note on too, you talked about, you know, having something that you're doing, something that you're working towards because you can't just get financial freedom, quit your job and then expect to, you know, a lot of us, the main goal is happy. The main goal yeah. is not like a number or anything like that. I, I saw something recently, I think it was Alex Hormozy, and it really resonated with me. People are their happiest when they feel useful. So yes. Mike Zuber, rental portfolio, financial freedom, left his day job, found himself not being as useful as before, right? Because you're you're contributing to the sales team and moving the company forward where you're at. Mm -hmm. You're building the rental portfolio. Now that's, you know, in place. The job is left and now what the heck am I doing, right? And so mm -hmm. I know for sure there's a lot of satisfaction that's, you know, nothing to do with the money where you get people out to Vegas to celebrate 50,000 subscribers. I'm sure you heard as like more stories than I did about, thank you so much. Your content has helped me. I've learned, I've grown. And so, you know, being useful. So there's, there's something to that. And I think that the listeners, um, something that, that I took out of what you said is, you know, have something that you're working towards and, I think something that a lot of people get stuck on, I, I hear this a lot when I'm talking to people, is they think they have to have it all figured out before they take step number one. Yeah. You never do, right? Like, yeah, that and that's, you know, this is funny. I was having this conversation earlier this morning with Coach Carson, you know, another one of the millionaires, uh, author of Small and Mighty Investor. And he asked me, he goes, he basically said, hey, you know, you're really good at doing this daily stuff. You're very committed you know, which I hear a lot, but then he's like, what's your vision? What's, what's your five-year plan for one rental at a time? And I had to tell him, I don't have a five-year plan. I, I don't, I, whatever it is, I am comfortable in the mud. I am comfortable in doing the work. I mean, a long-term vision for me, Matt, is tomorrow. Yeah. That's about as far <laughs> as I think, right? I am action oriented. I certainly want to get better every day. I certainly want to contribute every day, but I'm not sitting here. I couldn't tell you what my plan is three months from now. In fact, the only thing I have on my agenda is, is you know, President's Day weekend next year because I had to spend some money to book the event. But I, I, it's my, it's my greatest curse is no big grand vision, but my greatest superpower is I am willing to do the work. I'm willing to get in the mud and just keep grinding and keep working. So I'll take it. I'll, you know, I'm not. It, it is a weakness, but I'll take it. Yeah, I think it's also a strength, right? You're 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 in the boat row. Just work, man. Just work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like I'm I'm used to, to to being in the game, so I'm not gonna go on the sideline and just coach now and and not run around with you guys. I'm I'm on the court um mm -hmm. with you. So let's let's say what's up to a couple of people. We got Joey Garessi. 
you my buddy out in OKC. Man, that basketball team looks good this year. Uh, what's good, y'all? Yeah, Proud ORAP family member here. Appreciate all that both y'all do to help the masses to get to financial freedom. Thanks, Joey. And he gave me a shout out for, uh, uh, I, I probably got to redo that stuff. I don't know. Was that three years ago? It was. Yeah. All, yeah, three yeah. years ago, a bunch of videos, um, <laughs> which was me pressing record and just giving you some behind the curtain look at like, here's what mortgage people are going to tell you. Here's the numbers you really want to look at. And, you know, humbly, I, I, I thank you, Joey, but I, I agree that like it's valuable insight where you might with that little piece of the ORAT course, go out there and save yourself a few thousand dollars just because you oh, know yeah. a few things from a mortgage broker. It's, 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 it's wild to think about your, your section, obviously very valuable as a bonus. Right. And, the, and let's, let's be very clear that the, my course is wildly expensive at three ninety nine. dollars It's like a joke. And you could save thousands of dollars just with the mortgage content. So uh, one of the things I'm very proud of is I've kept it at a price point, even though every executive coach I talk to says the minimum should be nine ninety nine. I'm like, dude, you guys are not listening to me. I'm not here to bring every dollar out of this thing. I'm here to keep it at a price point where people feel committed because I tried free. Free doesn't work. Free sure. doesn't work for sure. So four hundred dollars seems to be a at least a current you know good point. But yeah, there's there's crazy value just in the bonus sections. Yep, yep, for sure. All right, what's up, Mr. Buzz Tune? Want to make sure I said hello to people who were joining us. Fire away with any questions you got um, for Mr. Zuber. Because cool thing, like I I know you're like me where nothing's off limits. Ask me anything. Sure. I heard something, Mike, that we've had conversations every single week for going on. It's got to be two and a half or three years. I, did, I didn't yeah. know anything about Wealth Building Pro. Tell me about ah! Wealth Building Pro. Oh, that's cool. Um, so I want to make sure I get the timing right. So this must have been 2009, either 2009 or 10, but probably started in nine. So at the time, Olivia and I, we have about 80 units after the flips and or 1031s in 06. The market really starts to roll over in Fresno, right? Just to give you a size of what it means. We bought a house, Norris Drive, 2002 for 107. We sold it for 265 three years later. It goes up all the way up to 300. Wow. And then it crashed to 75. Woo! 75% off, baby. Yeah. And then some. So, so what happens? So, right about the time Norris Drive gets to about 100 on the way down, because the whole market's just cratering. Fresno was the epicenter of California, Fresno and the Inland Empire, just Riverside, just decimated. Uh, I start picking up houses that used to go for 200 for sub 80 and they're all wrecked, just wrecked. And what we did is we had enough money at the time where we could do one at a time. So I would, I would pick up a house and I would just, I mean, I, I hear that wealth building pro is out there archived somewhere. So if you find it good for you, but I used to call them like the gumball house, the roach house, the the dirty dishes house, whatever they, there's just cute names because I never wanted to name the street. And I would just document the story. Hey, picked it up for this. We had to, you know, repair, blah, da, 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 da. Cost us why. Then we went back to a private lender and refied it 10%, got all our money back and did it again. Uh, at the time, I was writing for Bigger Pockets as well. And uh, what I was doing all ultimately became what they called Burr. Uh, but I was doing that you know, long before in, in writing about it on bigger pockets, but yeah, they, they took it to the next level by giving it a cool name, <laughs> but yeah, that's what Olivia and I did is we just bought junk that was wrecked. We did take some pictures and we, we threw them up on the, the, what I called a blog. And, um, we did that. I think we were writing, I think we wrote five or six houses just with Olivia and I, but at that point, our friends started to say, Hey, we want to help you. We want to be a part of that. And that was the first time we raised private money without ever asking. And we were paying 10 to 12% interest only. So Wealth Building Pro was kind of my YouTube channel before YouTube. It was just, wow. I'd go back and write once a week about what we were doing. So pretty cool. So essentially like a blog. It, it was a blog. Yeah, I would call it more like a, maybe because every every property was a chapter or a page or whatever you would call it. But yeah, it was, it was, it was fun. Turn that into a book. I could actually, I should go back and find it. Well, I mean, somebody sent me a link one time saying, hey, it's archived over at this thing, but I I, uh, I need to go find it. All right. Wealth Building Pro. Somebody go find it for us. Yeah, um, there you go. 
Glover, Glover says, I think I bought the course for $199 about three years ago. Best choice I ever made. Thanks, Glover, for uh, the shout. And of course, like, you know, anybody you talk to, I listen to a lot of inspirational stuff and I'm all, you know, wh whatever I can get that's going to help me with positive momentum and, and positive mindset. Like people talk about investments in real estate versus stocks versus 401k. Generally speaking, most anybody will agree and tell you the best investment you make is in yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And so quite honestly, if it's the course or not the course, maybe your investment is your time investment of 20 minutes a day to do the work, like Zuber tells folks, um, and get better at whatever skill it is. It can be analyzing a market. It can be, you know, getting really good in Canva or I don't know what it is, but like investing in yourself, um, you heard it here first. Best best investment you can make. <laughs> there you go. Um, all right. Well, Gressy's got a question for us. So we'll, we'll see. Fire away. Anybody who's live, fire away questions. If you're watching this on replay, um, I come back and check out the comments. So I'll answer them down the road. But while you got the legend Zuber, let's, let's hear your question. Guys, what do you think the percent chance is that FHFA permits realtor commissions to be included in mortgage loans in the future in response to expected NAR settlement charge? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So what I, so I, th so right now I am most concerned about VA buyers, our veterans, right? That is where, in my opinion, it's most acute. And I actually think it is such a glaring problem that they're going to somehow tweak the settlement to have a VA exception. Otherwise you got to change the VA program in some way, somehow. Uh, right now is, is it's currently written. You could in theory, in theory, not permit VA buyers to purchase homes again, right? Because they're not allowed to pay the commission. It's a non, whatever it's called, non-permissionable transaction or something like that. Cost, yeah. Yeah, cost. And um, it's a problem. It's a problem. So my hope is the settlement gets tweaked and calls out VA buyers as an exception. Um, otherwise, the loan program or FHFA or VA, they have to change. They just do. Um, and that's a long process. I can't imagine them changing that in less than two years. And that's a, that's a train wreck. That's a travesty. So my hope is the settlement has it tweaked because again, it's not approved. It's not inkjet. You can still pivot. We're not the only ones talking about it. Otherwise it's a year or two until that gets addressed. And that's a shame. Right. Yeah. Like you said, these things aren't going to happen quick. So it's not like, Oh, settlement. They, you know, tell us in July, here's how it's going to all shake out. And then, you know, you, you see a fanny bulletin come across in August that things have changed. Wouldn't happen that quick. And, you know, quite honestly, if, if I was a betting man, I would say that lending guidelines wouldn't change. And so I've heard like the biggest real estate group in the U S well, I can't remember the guy's name offhand, but he's got these humongous partnerships with huge corporations where, you know, him or his um, team and affiliates are handling tens of thousands of real estate transactions a year. Um, I, I think that maybe it was him, maybe it was somebody else I was listening to. The immediate change is going to be fairly dramatic and then it's going to slowly but surely kind of work itself back to closer to where we are today. And what I mean by that, and this is what I understood of it in simple terms from my simple brain, you know, it might be that like initially there's like 80% of people trying to operate in this, the buyer side gets nothing, the sell side gets a commission and only 20% of, of transactions are happening with a buy side commission. And then over time, it's going to flip back to 80, 20 and 20 mm -hmm. will still operate in the, the listing agents getting paid. They're going to bring their own buyer or, or, or something's going to get worked out. They give a piece of their commission. Um, but slowly but surely, they're going to work themselves back to, you know what? I'm going to get the highest price if I pay both sides. And it's going to look like today's structure, except for the, the one in five or 20% are going to you know yeah. operate with some different structure. The, the true answer is who friggin' knows? Who knows yeah. how it's going to all sort out? I, I will say to Joey's kind of the heart of his question is, in any settlement, like there's there's winners and losers. I think it's pretty clear as it's written today, sellers win, first time home buyers lose. It's yeah. just how it's written today. And and, 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 and that's not okay long term. I mean, I don't see how the government 
you know, who's all up in arms about first time home buyers and want to give 5k credits for this and that, how they don't look at this as a complete screwed up situation. A hundred percent. And and me and you've talked about this before, Mike, like, you know, investors, people who have skills around real estate, no problem. I can, no. I, I know enough to, to work my way, you know, cash buyer, no problem. So the people that, that, you know, need the least amount of help are going to like, yeah, pay less. I mean, you know, the crazy. sad part, the sad part is I have the financial wherewithal where I could pay a one or 2% bonus to any buyer's agent to bring me a great deal. Think about how horrible that is. We want first time home buyers on the property ladder. They're having right. a hard time saving three and a half percent. Then you got some rich guy out there that's like, hey, if you ever find a great deal, I'll give every buyer's agent a bonus to bring it to me first. Right. That's not what we want. We don't want that. That's horrible. Yeah, for sure. And you think about the current market we're in where there's limited inventory, it's already tough. And so, you know, sellers can operate with, with you know, a little bit of leverage knowing, oh, for that, sure. like, you know, hey, there's, there's, a, there's, you know, only. So, I mean, only it, there's there's been very few markets where a seller could offer zero, and their house would probably still sell. We're in one of those markets today, right? Right. We're, if I you mean, were we're, trying to do that in 2012, what a joke! That would have never happened. Yeah, you know what I'm hearing more of uh, now, Mike, because like you know, contrary to some belief, there's still plenty of demand out there. I'm hearing concessions on new builds start to crank down. And, and builders, you know, the people that are like known for giving away incentives and doing that, they're telling themselves, hey, listen, yeah. if I don't have to, why in the heck would I? So go yeah, I've already heard, I've heard that too. I, I yeah. actually, I bought a brand new build. Uh, Brian Lebo was, was my agent here in Vegas and he got paid 2% for, for, he didn't even see the house until we moved in. I guarantee you that Lennar would not have paid that or if they would have paid it, it would have been half that now. Right. And they bought your rate down and they gave and they bought right and they gave credit. me a yeah. you know 12% discount and I beat them I beat up Lennar hard and they still paid 2% to the to my agent just right. for registering my name. Yeah, for sure. All right, who else we got? Buzztune just bought Zuber's course endless value and access plus receive the Vegas event as a bonus. Yeah. Um, I like it. I like to hear it. I'm sure too that you're uh, in the Facebook group cuz I think of all the different mm -hmm. value that that brings like the community is a huge value and like, yeah, hey, the, I'm new uh, here. here's where I'm yeah. at. Here's what I'm up to. And, and people talking amongst themselves and collaborating. That's yeah, super the, freaking cool. The private Facebook group. I, I'll just be honest. I, I'd spend 400 bucks just to be in that group. Um, I opened it as an FAQ landing spot. Cause that was again, not being a big thinker of what we were doing. I just knew it was a spot I could communicate with my tribe. Right. And, um, Dude, I'm not even the most active. I'm not even the most active member by far anymore. Yeah. Right. It's just a community taking over. It's it's awesome. So yeah, if you're new, go introduce yourself. Get get some hugs and high fives from other course members. It's it's a it's a happy place to be. Yeah, there's some awesome, awesome folks in that community. Um, all right. Glover's got a question for you. Zuber, how do you get 30 year fixed financing for your property after you hit 10 to 20 properties? Uh DSCR loans. There are DSCR loans that do uh that. Uh, all the time. I even got a 30 year money on an apartment deal. That drives people crazy. So if they're, you're on my channel, there's a guy I have called Stephen Dow of Velocity Mortgage. They do 30 year fixed rate on apartments. I have an apartment building that I financed at 3.99 fixed for 30 years. Hello. I mean, hello. You can do, hello. You can do that if you pay attention. You know, by the way, we documented it on my channel. It, it was there. Lots of, lots of others did that as well. But yeah, I have an apartment building, commercial building. 18 units, 3.99. Thank you very much. Sweet, man. 30-year fix too. There's no five-year come knocking at your door. Hey, let's reassess and, and renegotiate this, which I think is you know part of the, the scary risk that has people stay away from the you know commercial stuff if they don't know it. So good, good on you for getting that. And you know, as a mortgage broker, I can speak to, you know, there's plenty of people that don't just hit 10 Fannie Freddie Max and they just quit, right? They find ways to do it. There's um, even you can on do portfolio loans, you right. can portfolio them and go back. And there's just, yeah. there's lots of ways you can do it, but you got to work with a professional like Matt, uh, to make those happen. If you're buying single family resi stuff, Matt, the mortgage guy is where to go. Yeah. I think he's all right. I think he's pretty, nah, he's, he's okay. He's, he's, he's only right. been on the channel a couple of years. <laughs> all right. Dan's got a question. I don't know if I know the answer to this, but what ultimately made you decide to move to Vegas and uh, also look at new area to invest in? 
So those are two different answers. I'll give them both. Um, I've been in the Bay Area for 50 years. was happy there. Uh, financially, fine. Olivia and I's vice, if you will, is we love to go eat out, right? We spend thousands of dollars every week eating out at good restaurants. And what happened during the pandemic is more than half our favorite restaurants closed. And the other half went severely downhill. And if, if it's the one thing you enjoy doing and it's not good anymore, you're willing to look elsewhere. So uh, we had always heard that Vegas had good food. We both had no experience with Vegas because I've been here a hundred times, but never left the strip. That was just what I did for my career. So we booked an Airbnb for a month with Brian Lebo, one of his Airbnbs, or what? what I guess it's not an Airbnb anymore, but whatever. We stayed there a month. We ate out twice a day for a month. Never had a bad meal. I think we had one bad meal. And Olivia said, let's do it. So that was the answer for why we moved. And then there's all the extra stuff, right? Traffic's better. People are more friendly. Taxes, you know, taxes. all of that. <laughs> I was yeah. going to say, everyone probably Ta was like, taxes. Taxes were not the choice. I mean, I, I'm lucky enough where that's not a problem. Um, it's certainly going to help. I'm like, you know, I'm not a fool. Uh, but I didn't come here for taxes. I came here because the one thing I enjoy doing every day was taken away. Yeah. And, you know. So that's why I did it. And then now why am I choosing to invest in Vegas? I got to tell you, I just have a calling. I, I just want to show, I want to show people what is in my course, right? How to get a buy box, how to do the work, how to network, you know, how to get something. So my intention is only to get a couple. I'm, I have no desire to re replicate what we did before. I just want to, I just feel like I have to do it. And oh, by the way, I'm, I'm, I, my vision is to create a, like a TV show. So I'm paying a guy to follow me around. We've already recorded one. We're recording another one tomorrow is to kind of just fully document the process. I think, I think that, you know, flipping shows and all of these real estate shows on TV are fun. E. Carlton Sheets, Tommy Vu, Tom Vu, whatever his name was, you know, they made get rich quick. Unfortunately, buy and hold real estate's not sexy. It's just not. I mean, oh, I bought a house and I held it for 10 years and did nothing to it. It's not a sexy story. But I believe, and we're going to find out, maybe it'll be a total flop and I waste money again. Won't be the last time. But I think learning a market, networking, learning new assets, that might be sexy. So I'm going to spend probably 10 grand, maybe 15 or 20 grand, seeing if I could prove it's sexy. And then, oh, by the way, just show people how it works. That's that's my vision. And maybe it's a crazy vision, but that's why. Yeah. My thought is even if it's not sexy, it will be that magic word, useful. I and so. you know, for for I it's it's funny. I'll, i I like when when I can, you know, draw parallels. And it's like being a parent, right? Like I can tell my kids a thousand times to do something. If they watch me do it, one it's easier for them to understand and learn. And two, they're more likely to do it. And I think the same thing goes for, you know, people like it's a tough market to invest in. I don't know. You know, I, I'm new to this market and I don't know it. And where do I start? And for you, I, I know at least, you know, I think I have an idea of the vision. It's like, I'll show you. Yeah. I'll go to a brand new market I've never invested in that I just moved to. I'll start from day one mm -hmm. and I'll do the work that I did in other markets here, brand new. Yep. And I'll buy deals in 2024, just like you could buy if you did the same work. Yeah. And so I think my, that's more yeah. impactful and useful. My, I hope so. I, I, it's not cheap what I'm doing because um, you know I got to pay a videographer. The same crew that did the event in Vegas is following me around. So they're oh, not cheap. Oh, they are phenomenal. Oh, yeah. those phenomenal, guys. not cheap. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, my whole vision for this, and I've told them, is I want to I make learning a market sexy if I can. And I want anybody to repeat what I'm doing anywhere at any time. That's my hope. And right now I'm committed to doing six episodes. May it, may it grow? I don't know. But I can already plan out six episodes and, and budgeted you know, six episodes. So we'll see. Sweet, sweet. I like it. We got, we got a comment from uh, LinkedIn. Joe Mortgage Reams. If a buyer's agent has five homes to show their client but tells the client that one of them will cost them an additional 2 3% in agent fees, the client won't even want to see that home. I agree. Seems logical to me. Right. Yeah. And and that this 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 breeds another question too, because I 
you know, I haven't spent hours because I just don't think it's useful for me to spend hours digging in and researching and reading pages. But one thing I do know that I read is that part of it is the agents cannot disclose what's going to be paid to the buyer's agent in the MLS. Like that's part Correct. of the agreement. That last line is important right. in the MLS. Yeah. And so I, I went for a walk with an agent the other day and he's like, I don't know. Do I create a site on the side? Do I, you know, do all the, like that's e just email templates around. It's just a oh, dumb yeah. rule. The email templates, text, text, you know, post or blasts. Yeah. There's, there's going to be lots of workarounds very quickly. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, like to Joe's point, great point, Joe, thanks for the comment. Like, yeah. And just so, one more part about Joe or Joe, Joseph's comment is in today's market, it probably doesn't matter because that hell somebody will buy it. Somebody will go to the listing agent, buy it. But I've been in, I've been doing this 20 years. We are in a, not quite the craziest seller's markets ever. That would be 2021, but it's still a seller's market. You fast forward a year and a half and we're in a buyer's market. Hello. Right. Yeah. You know watch what, out. You know what I just thought about? Because, you know, I've been around a real estate transaction or two in my <laughs> lifetime. And I've, I've, talked to, I've talked to a consumer or two. From a seller standpoint, and, and, and play devil's advocate, Mike, if you disagree, I'd love to have some banter yeah. on this. You're selling a home. Mm -hmm. And as an agent, I tell you, hey, listen, Mike, if we put this on the MLS, if we offer two, two and a half percent to a buy side agent to bring a buyer, you're going to get a first time home buyer. You're going to get somebody who's willing to pay quote unquote retail. We're going to get the highest price for your home. Mm -hmm. If you don't, sure, we might sell it, but you might get a savvy investor like Mike Zuber. You might get somebody else that's not going to pay you retail. They're going to want a discount. They're going to pay mm -hmm. less. And so do you want 90% of X price? without a buy side commission, or do you want a hundred percent and pay two and a half? Like to me, it just seems like logical. And yeah. I think a lot of sellers don't get that though. Well, again, I think seller, the average seller, you know, buys and sells two homes in their lifetime. That's just the average. And right now they're being blasted from the media with, you know, don't pay, you know, slash your commissions, don't pay the buy side. So they're going to try that. And it will probably be okay in the current environment. I promise you in a year and a half when this thing gets more balanced and we're kind of through this, it's going to be a mess. And oh, by the way, can you imagine the lawsuits? I don't know if people realize this, but the buyer's agent was not always a thing. There was a time, I think it was in the late 70s, it might have been the early 80s, where basically it was very standard just to have a listing agent and buyers would go to listing agents. It wasn't until you had lots of lawsuits because like you're representing the, the, the seller, but who's representing the buyer, right? You can't do both. So there was, there's reasons the buyer's agent was put in to protect the buyers. And if you just kind of rip that away, watch out dual agency. There's there, you know, lawyers yeah. going to get paid twice on this. They're going to get paid a bunch of money on this and they're going to get paid a bunch of money to sue on the other side. It's crazy. I saw a great post, Mike, and it was, it was an agent who said, I've successfully negotiated over 800 um, home transactions. I'm an absolute pro. You're telling me that I'm going to negotiate against an unrepresented buyer. Best of luck to them. Yeah. Good luck. And, and he's yeah. right. And it's, and it's, a, it's, you know, it's honestly, it's not good. And, and you made the point and, and I'll reiterate First time home buyers, VA buyers, oh. those are the ones that are going to get the shit end of the stick. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, and immediately really hurt the most. Immediately. All right. Who else we got? Glover, the private Facebook group is priceless. I agree. It's pure gold. Agreed. Um, Joey Garessi, how often do you guys shop landlord insurance policies? Um, I've shopped every year so far. Rates have been rising like crazy. Mm. He's in Oklahoma. Um, Oh, it consistently has some of the highest rates. What do they have in Oklahoma? Storms? I think they something? have hailstorms. Yeah, hailstorms. Sweet. Um, yeah. How often do you do that on your portfolio, Mike? Because I, I can I can answer real quick on my side. Um, I'm, I'm a set it and forget it type of guy. <laughs> um, and so if there's not problems, I'm probably not looking at it. And I know that, you know, from from what I've heard, mm -hmm. I could go look and I'm I'm in the best policy I can get. Yeah, so I, I'm lucky enough to have the size where I go to a broker. And the broker shops for me every year. So I would say we, I don't think we've changed in four or five years, but we shop every year. We shop every year. Yeah. I, uh, 
I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I can to make sure those things get paid. Cause I don't, <laughs> I don't want to non-renew myself, um, yeah. which, you know, is a quick little tangent on insurance. Um, lots of places across the country, insurance is a problem. And mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard. One of the recent ones I heard was a client got a letter. We have an overhead shot. Uh, because of the way your roof slows, something's totally ridiculous in my eyes. We're not going to renew you. Had another one up in Pollock Pines, which is, you know, kind of, um, you know, remote in, in Northern yeah. California. And this client of mine could not believe the agent when the agent was like, Dave, I promise it's not me, but your insurance is going to double. And he got the non-renew from his current. So his options were pretty limited. And he thought that it was like, hey, I'm interested. I said, Dave, I'm introducing you to the broker that I use, the broker that does 80% of the purchase business I do. Like this guy can shop and he's getting you the very best, which happens to be only a double. You could probably find a triple somewhere else, but. Um, yeah, yeah. California insurance is wild this year. They they finally have a, I think they passed some resolution that's going to hopefully bring it back. But basically in California, we had rules that insurance companies couldn't only raise by a certain amount. And unfortunately, with the wildfires and all these other things, they were just not profitable. So every you know insurance company just decided not to compete and left the market. We were down to, I think, one or two. And then you had this kind of California worst case scenario bucket. It was horrible. It was bad. I, I think it's getting better now. But yeah, insurance is a problem. Look at, look at Florida. Look at Texas. It's a problem. Yeah. And, and, and for anybody who's following one rental at a time or has you know an investor... Um, as, as their main focus, I know people that bought in Florida and it was Airbnb, it was this insurance rate. And so all of a sudden I, I got to make it a long-term rental. And my insurance went from 1200 to 3,800. It went from a cash flowing piece of real estate to an alligator real, real quick. So you got to be careful, uh, with, uh, with insurance for sure. It's, it's something too, that I think there's, there's different areas of the country. I know Northern California better than most people like, Oh, I can buy up the hill mm -hmm. and I can buy it for 20 or 30% less than what I buy it down here. Be careful. You know, be careful. The California fair plan. The insurance policy goes with that is going to make it to where you're, you're paying the same monthly outflow. All right. Glover's got a question about San Jose, your old stomping mm -hmm. grounds. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing homes in San Jose getting or going for 150 to 250 above list price. Wild. In D neighborhoods, the single family homes are priced accurately to the neighborhood comps. Are these real buyers or corporations? Uh, I'll tell you that I'm 99.9% .9 sure these are individuals. What you have going on in the Bay Area right now is you have a lot of pump money coming out of the stock market, RSUs. Just think about NVIDIA. NVIDIA by itself. NVIDIA is a Silicon Valley based company. Uh, NVIDIA's stock uh, valuation has, has gone up about a trillion dollars. Their employees probably own 1%, half a percent of a trillion dollars. All their RSUs are worth a gazillion dollars. So you, what you have is you just have a lot of employees at tech companies, AI companies, selling their shares and putting into another asset. So we have very limited supply on entry-level stuff. And we have a consumer base in the Bay Area that's been trying to buy for a couple of years. And right now, they're pissed off. And when you got a consumer pissed off with a big checkbook, they write stupid offers. And I think that's what's happening. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. And uh, yeah, that's that's the thing. I, I deal with a lot of, you know, Bay Area money where, you know, year after year, those restricted stock units have vested and they've got stock portfolios and, you know, either their friends or their family or themselves or somebody has said, listen, Let's not have it all in stock. Exactly. It, Let's yeah, have some of that in real estate. And so, you know, some of the some of the conversations I have, you probably wouldn't agree with, Mike, but like mm -hmm. they're so like incentivized to diversify into real estate and they believe in real estate, which I do too. Over time, you hold it, it's mm -hmm. gonna appreciate. Yeah. There's gonna be debt pay down. That they they'll tell me, oh, if it if I put down 30% and it's negative 700 to a thousand a month, that's fine. Um, uh, I have a story about that in my book, one rental at a time. I had a senior executive tell me he was buying four alligators in Louisiana because of some tax abatement or tax loophole or some nonsense. Sure enough, that did not work out well. Uh, but anyways, I mean, Hey, if, 
you got you got a, you got the job and the stroke to do it. You know, hey, it's what's my opinion? You know, go for it. But yeah, back to the other point about corporations. I don't also think I also think the chance that a big corporation is going to make a play in California, given the legislature, is highly unlikely. Right. There are a lot more friendly places for corporations to buy homes. Yeah, so I don't I I highly doubt it's corporations. Yeah, it's it, it's 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 you know some somewhat monopoly money for some of these. Oh, exactly. Exactly. No, I mean, I, I, I grew up there. I, I know engineers, I know uh, sales guys, I know marketing leaders that make seven figures a year when they include their RSU grants. So I talked to one today about 1.5 between, you know, yeah. base plus RSUs. And so, yeah, uh, yeah it's not buying uncommon a, buying a house, whether it's one, one or one, two, five, what's the doesn't difference? matter. Yeah. just doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Well, I'm going to I'm going to stop us here at 3:45. Respect your time. Let you get to it. I'm uh, you know, plugging in deals. The market is hot, man. The spring has sprung and uh, all of a sudden Dude, I'm I telling you rates still below 7. I mean, that's a, that's the marker. Rates below 7 brings out marginal demand in an environment where supply is tight. It's not going to be good. Yeah. And and that's the thing too is is I had this fear and I voiced it before and I still have it. If you have like the seasonality swing of it's springtime, more buyers, more buyers. And behind that, you get the fuel lower, of six, nine, rates. six, eight, six, seven. And like, as the rates go down, like incrementally, you've said it. And I've, I've heard like, you know, Altos research and others, it doesn't take five and a half percent interest rates to fuel demand. When you go from six, nine to six, five, that's oh. a push. And you've already got tailwind, Mike. You've already got yeah. the tailwind of, of seasonality. It's going to be tough for buyers. And so, um, mm. you know, we'll see right now. Um, what I'm seeing is a lot of competition and, um, you know, buyers are, are hungry to buy. Um, yeah, this, this is my biggest concern. We could be we could be on the cusp of creating a bubble. And I haven't said that before. Right. I'm the guy that's like, hey, sorry, supply and demand works. But this is my fear. We still run into an environment where lock-in is happening. It's not as strong as it was last year, but it's still there, which means limited supply. We say rates fall down to six and a half, six and a quarter, just enough to unleash demand, but not really a lot of supply. And we got a pissed off consumer, just like we talked about earlier, just going, damn it, I want one, give me one. And they do crazy things like go 10 or 20% over list. If we do that enough, that could be a problem. That could be a that could be that final straw that that creates a housing bubble, and folks, I did it once before. If you ever read my book One Rental at a Time, I sold at the peak. I'll do it again. I and I own a lot more houses now, but if we get to that environment that's that stupid, pay attention because I'll sell. I'll sell just like last time. Right. Yeah. I'm I'm rooting for sub five percent appreciation for this year and next year. Absolutely. I know, I know yes. anything above it is going to be unhealthy and it's going to be a sign of like way too much fuel on the demand side. So we shall see. Thanks for joining me today, Mike. I appreciate your Later. time, brother. Bye. See ya.